No Crying in Baseball is a new book by Aaron Carlson on the inside story of A League of Their Own, the iconic 90s film. Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for inviting me on. Madonna, Tom Hanks, Gina Davis, Lori Petty, Rosie O'Donnell in town. I mean, this was a time before cell phone cameras and TMZ. Talk a little bit about what that celebrity, you know, all those celebrities all in Chicago land, you know, what that experience was like. All right. So um, in the early 90s, like we didn't have social media. So, you know, you didn't have these 24 seven videos and like celebrity news coverage, you know, of the A-listers. So seeing one was incredibly rare. Like if you saw Tom Hanks or Madonna in the flesh, that was a moment for you. And at the time, you know, of filming A League of Their Own in Chicago in 1991, Madonna was no joke. You know, I, I cannot understate this, like, like <laughs> the most famous woman in the world, you know, apart from like Princess Diana. She was a massively successful pop star who really wanted to be an actress, you know, and her acting career was a little slow going because, you know, she didn't have a reputation for being, uh, you know, how do I say this bluntly? Well, I should just say it bluntly. Uh, an acting talent, you know, she really had to hone her craft. So she decided um, to be part of an ensemble cast in a league of their own, you know, one of many actresses and actors and extras involved in this big sprawling production. So, um, you know, she worked hard. She, you know, embraced her role as all the way May Mortabito. And she worked harder than anyone. She got up at 4 a.m. every day, jogged along Lakeshore Drive, went to the, you know, Illinois Technology Institute, ITT, right? Yeah. IT, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, and then, re, you know, trained, you know, batting practice, the whole nine yards for four hours, and then um, went to dance practice for the Suds Bucket sequence at Fitzgerald's in Berwyn. So everyone was in awe of her and just her insane work ethic. And it was pretty insane because I would never get up at 4 a.m. <laughs> for anything. <laughs> but, but you, you also think of Madonna, you know, at that time. And obviously people who grew up in that age, you know, remember, you know, the Blonde Ambition Tour and Dick Tracy. And, you know, these were all the things that she was <laughs> coming off of that she was just huge. And every song was on the radio and you knew everything about her. And I guess comparing it now, it would be kind of what like Taylor Swift is doing. Everywhere she goes, it's sold out and people are watching her. Or like a Lady Gaga where she's, in Las Vegas, she's in the Joker. She, you know, has her own pop music, you know, tour where you never know what she's going to do. But there's always just big success around those projects. Um, absolutely. And um, I, you know, Taylor, to me, the Eras tour, which I'm so sad. I never, I just tried to get a ticket to go, you know, and I was like, I'm not paying $400 for a ticket. You know, I didn't strike when the iron was hot. And then I tried to get a ticket in San Jose. and They were like four grand you know, missed opportunity there. Um, but yeah, the Eras concert is so much like Blonde Ambition. It's global. The fandom is intense, you know, and and Taylor has reached that level of celebrity where like Madonna in 1991, she's a phenomenon. And I thought of Madonna just showing up anywhere in that era when Taylor went to her producer, Jack Antonoff's wedding in this random New Jersey club <laughs> and it was swarmed like th like the wedding was basically ruined because uh, Taylor's fans were trying to get inside basically like that doesn't really happen so much anymore because the mystery and glamour of celebrity is 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 gone thanks to social media and you know every celebrity has like um, a side hustle they're like let me show you how to make pasta on their Instagram, <laughs> but Taylor doesn't have to do that. You know, she's reached a higher echelon. You oh, know? Exactly. And then speaking of, of random places, Madonna, like when, you know, when I think of Madonna, I think she's probably staying at a you know, five star hotel. She's going to the best restaurants. Um, she's having this A list, you know, experience in the Gold Coast. But she was at Rosebud on Taylor Street for her assistant's birthday. She was in uh, Boys Town. She was at a, a drag show. She was in a tour with herself, which I think just that just cracks me up because I can't imagine anyone now could mention the word Toyota in front of Madonna. <laughs> um, that was my favorite. Okay. So all of that, um, 
wonderful detail is courtesy of Tony Savino. He's an incredible dancer. Um, he also appeared in the Dunka Shane, you know, part of Ferris Bueller. He's based in Chicago and he's won all these awards for the Jitterbug. So he and Madonna really bonded on the set of the movie. He was in that uh, Suds Bucket dance sequence and he was her dance partner and they became friends. He had a Toyota Tercel, which is a really, it was like the Honda Accord of the nineties. It was just a really popular car. <laughs> Um, so he drove her around the city in his Tercel. And at one point, Madonna goes, you need a car with stronger air conditioning. <laughs> but she was not above that. You know, she's she grew up in Detroit. Um, she grew up middle class, part of a large Irish, not Irish, excuse me. I'm thinking of Rosie O'Donnell, Italian, um, Italian Catholic family. So she she knows you know, she was ordering, you know, requesting Evian over ordinary water on set. But she knows how the real people live, for sure. Yeah. She appreciates that. You know, one of the things, too, you just mentioned uh, Rosie O'Donnell was because Rosie was an up and coming comedian at that point. And probably one of my all time favorite Madonna interviews um, is Madonna and Rosie O'Donnell on Arsenio Hall. If you have not seen it, go check it out. It's they're promoting the movie. Hey. Have you seen it? It's one of the greatest things I've ever seen in my life. And I discovered it yeah. while researching the book because you go, you go down various YouTube rabbit holes. You never know what gems YouTube is going to find. And so Madonna, you know, she didn't really want to promote the movie because she wasn't happy with the um, level, the minimal screen time she got, even though she was incredible in the movie. But Rosie O'Donnell became one of her best friends. They really bonded on set. And Rosie, you know, Rosie wanted to milk it, you know? This, is, this <laughs> was fun for her. This was a breakout for her. So I believe I can see her persuading Madonna, come on, let's go in Arsenio. Let's promote this movie. Rosie loved the movie. Madonna had mixed feelings about it. You know, she would have made a big stink about Dottie leaving the league and the league ending. Like she would have a different ending if she were the director. So they went on Arsenio and this was an incredibly like talk shows were so incredibly low budget and they were unfiltered and real. And I feel like the, the talk show was on so late at night that, you know, nobody felt like everybody was you know they probably felt like just a few people are watching Arsenio's fans and they'd like this but um like Madonna had this Mae West aesthetic very sarcastic very funny um very jaded um and over the top and Rosie was just you know her comic foil and their banter is the stuff of like you know, comedy legends. Um, I'm glad this video is um, being unearthed by Madonna fans and internet sleuths, and it's making the rounds lately. And I'm glad because I feel like Mo and Roe, as they were known on the set, they should have their own comedy tour, like Amy Poehler and Tina Fey are doing. I don't oh, know. Do you agree? Absolutely. One one hundred percent. Because it was, you know, you think of a talk show now, and it's like even if you have the biggest star, it's you get eight minutes, maybe 15 if it's, you know, Harry Styles yeah. or Brad Pitt or somebody. But other than that, I mean, they took up almost the whole entire hour and Madonna's dad came out and it was just, it was the most real that I've ever seen her. Yeah. And I love that Rosie and her are still, are still friends. Oh, they're still friends. You know, Madonna is still making headlines um, for a lot of reasons, you know, she's still in the spotlight and, and anytime she gets some sort of backlash or criticism, Rosie always responds on her Instagram in defense. And I love that. Um, I, I don't understand. I feel like Madonna can do no right with some people and they're always going to criticize her no matter what, but Rosie's like the best friend that you could ever have. You know, she's like a mother figure for Madonna. You know, Madonna and Rosie, they both lost, lost their mothers to breast cancer at, you know, age five. And they were very young when they lost their mom. So they connected over that. And Madonna, her entire life, you know, filling the void of her mother has collected mother figures. And Rosie was one. And I just, I love their friendship. Uh, and I do think they should start their own tour, I feel like. 
I'm on to something there. Yeah, we need to start a campaign. Madonna, Rosie, and Arsenio Hall, the three of them together, <laughs> sold. Yes. Um, let's also talk a little bit about Tom Hanks because Tom Hanks, um, Penny Marshall directed him in Big. And so the two of them had a working history together. But his career wasn't like, it's not the Tom Hanks that we know now in the early 90s. Oh, yeah. Um, Tom Hanks, like, he had his breakout moments. Splash, you know, um, was his first leading man role, and it was a sleeper hit. But Big was his real breakout moment. And, you know, that's when he played a 13-year-old boy who wakes up overnight in the body of a 30-something man and, like, oh, has to deal with that. And it's heartwarming and funny and very Penny Marshall. She always knew where the comedy was. She always knew where the heart was. She was the director. This was their first collaboration, and it was Penny's... Um, you know, a uh, big breakout as well. She became the first woman to hit a hundred million at the box office. And Tom got an Oscar nomination for this. However, his movie choices after big were not great. He did Bonfire of the Vanities, a notorious flop. Joe versus the Volcano, one of my favorite movies ever, underrated, critically underrated, was also a flop. Um, he did the movie, The Burbs, which was kind of like a B comedy. So he, you know, um, kind of faltered in Hollywood and he went away for a while after Bonfire. He just like stopped making movies for a year and a half. And he wanted to like inch his way back into um, onto the big screen, but he didn't want to star in a movie. He wanted to disappear in it. So Jimmy Dugan offered him an opportunity to play a character who is so not Tom Hanks. <laughs> he is gross, he's a slob, he's a sexist, um, he's crude, he's rude, um, he's an alcoholic, just everything that Tom Hanks is not. And he loved digging, um, like immersing himself into that role. He loved baseball. So he just wanted to be part of a big company, a big team. And this movie offered him the chance to do that, but he had to beg for the role you know, the studio Columbia was not jumping up and down to cast Tom Hanks. They wanted somebody with international appeal to play Jimmy Dugan. So this makes me laugh, but they were looking at somebody like Michael Douglas, who was a big star, you know, fatal attraction, you know, those adult dramas yeah. um, uh, of the early nineties. So um, Penny convinced them to cast him. And I think like the rest is history after that movie, you know, became came his like unprecedented streak, once in a lifetime uh, winning streak for an actor at Forrest Gump, Saving Private Ryan, Philadelphia, two Oscars, Castaway, and my favorite Tom Hanks movie is You've Got Mail. <laughs> all, all iconic movies. And I think that maybe, do you think that his trajectory would have been different had he not delivered? I mean, it's the title of your book, No Crying in Baseball. He gets to say it. He gets to be a part of this movie. If this was if this wasn't not Tom Hanks, I don't think we would have Tom Hanks in all those movies, you know, that you just mentioned. Oh yeah, I, I Penny Marshall, um, you know, her loyalty, um, her, she and Tom had this shorthand with speaking and this trust between um, the two, and like he could translate Penny for other people. She had a thick, kind of lethargic, lethargic Bronx accent that even um, her daughter sometimes couldn't understand <laughs> too well. Um, but he would translate for her on set. And they had this incredible rapport. And I think she's responsible for a lot of his success. You also watched some of Rosie O'Donnell's interviews where she's talking to Penny Marshall and she does a good impression of, of Penny Marshall's uh, accent as well too. Yes, she does. I mean, one of the best. But what's so funny, I interviewed 120 people for this book. And they all, you know, famous or not, crew member, cast member, they all just unsolicited did their own Penny impression. <laughs> so they just did it. They're like, oh, why am I doing this movie? You know. <laughs> so now I feel like I'm, I'm, I have one. I have a Penny Marshall impression. And I also have a Nora Ephron impression from my first book, but that only comes from hearing so many other people's impressions of, of those iconic directors. 
as far as the, the filming goes in, in Chicago, one of the things that I found uh, fascinating was if you look back at that time, it was right when the Bulls were in the middle of their championships, the beginning of the three peep, the city was electric. Um, talk a little bit about how that impacted uh, the filming of this movie. Oh, yes. And 1991, Chicago Bulls, um, just my favorite sports dynasty. Like, I just, you know, I just had to, like, expand on that in the book because it was just my indulgent. I was like, this has nothing to do with baseball. <laughs> but, you know, you can't separate Michael Jordan in 1991 from Chicago um, in 1991. So I just loved writing about, the, you know, the um, celebration at Grant Park. Um, so the crew members told me that they had never seen a city go that nuts. Like, like, and these were crew members who lived in New York and LA and New York is a big sports town. They've never seen people go that nuts as they did for the Chicago Bulls. And Lori Petty wanted her Rockford Peaches jersey to have 23 on the back, uh, just like Jordan. So everyone sort of got into the spirit of things, except for Madonna. Madonna did not love being in Chicago. <laughs> she's not said some kind things about her city, but I still love her anyway. And like, I feel like Same. she's one of those talents that like, I think she kind of says it's just to get a rise out of people. I don't believe oh, it. I need to see, I need to her to talk to me and then I'll, we'll settle this. Yeah, I don't believe it either. She's a button pusher, you know? Oh yeah. my God, she, she would like, she would just... I, I would just run away from her on set. I'd be like Gina Davis. <laughs> Speaking of Gina Davis, uh, Deborah Wingo was, was originally supposed to play the part, um, but maybe talk a little bit. Did Penny and Deborah have a history together? Because, you know, Deborah had Terms of Endearment, Officer and a Gentleman, but those were early 80s. And Gina Davis had Beetlejuice, Thelma and Louise, Accidental Tourist. Like she was kind of that it star at that point. Like talk a little bit about maybe those two and maybe Deborah's connection to, to Penny and how she might have been the first choice. Oh yeah. Um, so um, Deborah Winger was the first, um, was initially cast to play Dottie Hinson, the best player in the league. And she and Penny, um, you know, they kind of hung out in the same circles. Um, Deborah was an extremely prestigious actress at the time. And she was incredibly beloved uh, by American audiences, Terms of Endearment, uh, Officer and a Gentleman. At the same time, she was, you know, she developed a reputation for being extremely difficult in Hollywood. It took her forever to sign on to do a role, to decide to do a role. And once she did, she could make things difficult on the set. So um, Penny thought she could handle that. And Deborah, by the way, was a good ball player. She had a lot of grit, um, a lot of spunk, and um, she just kind of like, you could picture her as a 1940s ball player for the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. She just, if you look at pictures of the actual women, Deborah fits the mold. And so Lori Petty was cast to be her younger sister, Kit Keller, because they looked so much alike. They had those large, sparkly, light eyes, and those just beautiful kind of delicate features. Um, Deborah went, a, you know, I don't want to say, I'm not going to use the C word, the crazy word. I'm just not. Um, I hate it when women are, are called that. She, um, she got really upset <laughs> <laughs> when uh, Madonna was in talks to play All the Way May. And she um, thought that Madonna's casting would tarnish the quality of the film. And she told Penny so. She's like, if you cast Madonna, it's going to be a long, hot summer. So Penny took that as a threat. And she goes, no one's going to tell me how to cast my movie. So um, Deborah was fired, but she was given around $3 million to exit the film. So in my opinion, Deborah won a league of their own. <laughs> She especially, won. especially three million dollars <laughs> in 1991 is a lot different than three million dollars now i mean you could yeah just retire like yeah she was just done yeah <laughs> everybody wins but um so gina um gina really wanted a challenge she was just coming off thelma and louise she had won an oscar for accidental tourists and she had a lot of prestige as well so um she um signed on very quickly to replace deborah and you know, the rest of the cast was worried. They're like, 
what's this going to mean for us? Because they love Deborah and they were like, oh, captain, my captain, <laughs> you're leaving us. And Lori was like, I look nothing like this woman. Um, she's like, I'm, this is, you know, I'm going to be fired too. And Penny is so loyal. That was never going to happen. They gave Lori a like strawberry <laughs> blonde um, page boy half wig, you know, that was sort of the same color as Gina's just to match their hair colors. But otherwise they looked um, very, very different. But I think that Lori, um, I think that worked for them because Lori was able to um, pour her insecurities um, into her role because she very, very much felt intimidated by Gina. She's like, here's this beautiful, glamorous, you know, Oscar winner who was in Tootsie and then here's me and nobody, you know, Point Break hadn't come out yet. And Lori was so awesome in that. But, you know, she was still an unknown, but she was a, you know, great ball player, had a great wind up, uh, you know, did a lot of her own stunts. Whereas Gina um, happily um, conceded her stunt work to her, um, her doubles who were men and women. Oh my goodness. Well, I, mean, I could talk to you for three and a half hours. This has been <laughs> so incredible. Please go check out the book, No Crying in Baseball. It's available in stores now. Uh, this was so awesome. And uh, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me.